I'll now introduce our first speaker, David Callow, Senior Urban Forester in the City of Melbourne. David's been working in horticulture, arboriculture and natural resource management for um, 17 years as a consultant. His role at the City of Melbourne is responsible for implementing the urban forest strategy through the annual tree planting program. David's passionate about creating healthy and diverse urban forests through community participation and continuous improvement. David's topic is values of the urban forest, completion of fourth year participation process in the urban forest strategy. Please welcome David Callow. Hi everyone. How do we get that one going? Okay, thank you. Um, so my presentation today is really about our four-year journey um, and the, the, the revolves around the urban forest strategy and also our urban forest precinct plans, which are an implement, implementation strategy for each of the precincts in the city of Melbourne. So to start, we'll start with a few horror stories around community engagement, because um, they're always fun. Uh, Canberra, 2009. So Canberra undertook an assessment of its urban forest. And uh, the assessment was done and, and it was concluded that there was an extensive renewal program that was required. And, uh, and so they ripped into it. And uh, then the Ombudsman was called in and there was an investigation into the, the renewal of the urban forest. And so probably a fail in terms of community engagement, but hopefully we can learn from that experience. Uh, 2012, the Layman Street figs in Newcastle. Two years of debate, $2 million spent um, for the removal of 14 figs. Police riot squad was called in to you know, facilitate the removal of the figs in the end, and I'd say probably a fail as well in terms of community engagement. I don't want to pump our own tyres, but you know, City of Melbourne, we've been on this four-year journey. Last week, we removed 16 mature plane trees from Flinders Street, you know, a high-profile site in the middle of the City of Melbourne. We got two, maybe three emails, people asking how we're going to, um, what we're going to replace the trees with and, uh, and how the project was progressing. But that doesn't happen by accident. So there's four years of work that sort of precede that process and that, and that renewal, those renewal pro projects that go on sort of every week, you know, throughout the year. So um, let's jump into it. So more about the Lamer Street figs. This is the city of Melbourne in terms of context and, and this is where our journey began. We, we manage about 70,000 trees and that's increasing Every year, we plant 3,000 trees every year um, to increase our, the, the quality and quantity of the urban forest. In 2011, I was employed as a consultant for the City of Melbourne and undertook an assessment of the trees and assessed roughly, roughly half the trees in the City of Melbourne and ranked them for useful life expectancy, looking at what the likely uh, losses were in terms of the tree population over the coming years. And that, that, that cast a pretty dim view on the overall tree population. And this was right at the end of the drought, right when we had trees under extreme stress. There was, there was um, severe water restrictions. And a lot of the trees in the city of Melbourne had been watered, you know, some of them nightly, you know, particularly around sports fields for many, many years. And so the impact of the drought and the water restrictions combined had had a, a very severe effect on the, the health of the tree stock within the city of Melbourne. And so, out of that process, and, and at the start of that journey, it was decided that we'd develop an urban forest strategy for the City of Melbourne. And one of the other guiding documents that sits fixed the urban forest strategy is the Urban Forest Diversity Guidelines, which, which talks a lot about tree selection into the future and about how we diversify the overall tree population to, re to reduce our vulnerability to pests and diseases. So what's the goal of the urban forest strategy? It's really about a city in a forest. So we, we, we're creating a greener landscape, a more livable landscape for the, for the visitors, for the residents, 
um, for the workers in the city of Melbourne. And these, these images are, are somewhat aspirational, but we need to be moving you know, into a space where we value green as we value grey. And uh, I mean, Roger's, Roger's talking next about, particularly about green infrastructure, and that will, I think that'll be important in terms of you know, setting the context around the value of green infrastructure. So what are the, the, the principles that sit you know, in the urban forest strategy? So seven key principles. Um, mitigate and adapt to climate change. Number one, reduce the heat, urban heat island effect. Design for health and wellbeing, for livability in the city. Create healthier ecosystems. We're currently drafting an urban uh, ecology and biodiversity strategy that will guide the way that we look at nature in the city for coming years. Um, become a water sensitive city, increasingly important. You know, we're now we sit at about 25% of our irrigation needs are provided by stormwater, but we want to increase that with time. Position Melbourne as a leader in urban forestry and design for livability and cultural identity. So what are the, what are the strategies? What are the, what are the key on the ground outcomes that we see uh, from the urban forest strategy? Number one is about increasing canopy cover. And that's really about cooling the city and reducing those peak temperatures, particularly in summer. So we're increasing canopy cover from 22% to 40% by 2040, and that's primarily by planting new trees, by increasing the health of existing trees, and, and overall increasing the, the canopy cover. We want to increase the urban forest diversity to increase the vulnerability of the tree population, improve the, uh, the vegetation health, so it's providing maximum the ecosystem services benefits to the, to the people within the city, improve soil moisture and water quality, improve urban ecology. I, I spoke before about the urban ecology and biodiversity strategy that we're developing. And also, lastly, but you know, probably one of the most important is to engage with the community and bring people along on their journey along the way. You know, be transparent, explain what we're doing, you know, talk about the rationale behind our decisions. And so what are the principles behind the engagement? There's lots of words here, and we'll, I don't want to use words too much, but we'll, we'll run through these and then we'll get into some of the information behind this. But, to understand you know, the community's thoughts and perceptions about the urban forest, we need to know what people are thinking, what they want to see in the future. Um, we, we need to understand, so we need to raise their understanding and awareness of, of the value and the, the necessity of urban, e urban ecosystems you know, in terms of their contribution to a livable city. Um, and we also need to build resilience for the future and uh, help them un understand why we select particular trees, why we, we, we're increasing diversity in some areas while we're planting evergreen trees, while we're planting deciduous trees, and to encourage the debate within the community, to allow people to participate in the decisions that we make. So what are some of the tools that we've used to get those messages across and to engage with the community and get them to participate in the, in the programs that we've had? So we've used local press. We've, we, we had an art and design competition, um, which I'll speak about in a moment. Um, we've had you know, many press releases, briefings, we've had champions in the media. Greg Moore has been one of our champions in the past. Um, we had a dedicated website for the urban forest strategy. There was a YouTube video um, that was kicking around at that time. Our dedicated website had, you know, 15,000 people who clicked on that site, 4,000 people who actually tracked through that site, and another 400 who actually made comments, you know. Um, we had a town hall forum. We kicked off with a World Cafe forum in the, in the, in the town hall. And we've had uh, over 20 workshops now um, where we've had up to 100 people from the community who come and provide their views about the urban forest and the urban forest precincts and how the, st the street tree planting might look in the future in their actual streets. So I'm just going to go through some of the involved actions now. So our consultation, it's community, we call it community consultation or community participation. And what we've done is in the past, you know, traditionally councils would work at this sort of level. You know, they would be, this is, sorry, I'll just go back a step. This is the IAP2 public participation spectrum. The IAP2 is the peak body in Australia and probably internationally around um, community participation and community engagement. And this is their, this is their model um, for engaging with the community. And so councils would traditionally engage at this level. They would inform people what was happening or they may consult but what we've done is through our workshops and through our engagement over the last four years, we've moved to an involved level and in some cases to a collaborate level where people are actually helping us shape those documents, helping us redraft those documents before they're produced. 
And so what's, what's some of the other involved actions we've had? We, had? we do community planting days, and this is a really practical way for people to get out and experience the urban forest and to have conversations with people about particularly our objectives for the urban forest in the future. We've got an exceptional tree register. And so what, what we did is when we were looking at the urban forest and we were looking, we managed the public realm. So we managed the streets and the parks and those areas that uh, land, that's, land that's accessible to everyone. Whereas there's a lot of tree canopy on, um, on private property as well within the city of Melbourne. And we said, well, how do we, go, how do we best protect those trees that are on private property? And so we looked at what other councils were doing across Melbourne and we looked at people who had local laws or they had planning overlays and we said, well, are they working effectively? Lots of people have that, that protection. But we said, well, how many trees do you actually approve to be removed and how many do you approve to be retained? And over, over all those councils, overwhelmingly, people said over 90% of the, the applications that come in, trees are approved for removal. So we said, wait a minute, you know, you've got a, a full-time officer who's administering this program and you're removing 90% of the trees. I don't think this is going to work best for the City of Melbourne. So we said, all right, let's look at this objectively and look at other avenues that we might have to protecting trees but are not going to be resource expensive. So we, we, we acknowledge that we have some really significant trees. So we, we, we developed an exceptional tree register and that has over 200 trees now that are on that register throughout the City of Melbourne. And now that they have planning protection and they're covered, you know, there's, a, there's an Australia... Australian standard for tree protection um, guidelines on each, of the, each one of those trees. So where there's a planning application that involves those trees, we're able to invoke the requirements of the Australian standard when it comes to building around those trees. So we had um, our urban forest art and design competition as well, and we had over 400 people who submitted um, designs for that competition. And these were some of the examples, some of them quite beautiful, some of them quite aspirational. Um, this is, we had a children's art, uh, art and design competition as well. And this was our first event. This was our World Cafe Forum. And Council was really reluctant to allow, allow us to do this event at the Town Hall. They said, look, we're not sure this, this is going to be too controversial. And in the end, though, there was an overwhelming response that people wanted more of this sort of involvement. They wanted to know more about the urban forest. And this was right at the start of when we were developing the strategy. And so it was about, all about building trust and, and not allowing people to realise that we were going to be transparent through the process. And this is our dedicated website. And as I said before, over 15,000 people visited this website during our consultation period. And we had nearly 400 people who commented on the website. And nothing was ever moderated or deleted from the website. We allowed the conversations to... Um, to, I guess, continue. And it, it was interesting, you know, like when you looked at what happened on the website and what happens typically in our workshops is you get a whole bunch of people in the room and they actually end up being self-moderating in some ways. You have the squeaky wheels and you have the people who have a particular agenda. But on the whole, everyone in that room has, a, has you know, a, an opportunity to have their say. And so those people are moderated by the other opinions that are in the room. And, and similar things were happening on the website. People were chiming in and saying, they weren't City of Melbourne employees, but they're saying, no, no, wait a minute, this is what it says, this is the balanced argument. And so by being transparent with the community, it cut out a lot of the work that we might have to do in putting out those spot fires. And this is an example of some of the workshops that we've undertaken. We've had, as I said before, 20 workshops, you know, over 1,000 people have had face-to-face -face interactions with, um, with City of Melbourne staff and have had a chance to contribute to our strategy and also our precinct plans. And these are the precinct plans. Seven have now been ratified by council and three more will be, are in draft form at the moment. And these are essentially a 10-year planting plan for each one of our precincts. And so how do we work to develop those precinct plans? How do we work collaboratively with the community at that higher level on that IAP2 spectrum? So what we did is we, um, we had workshops. We, we ran a workshop in each precinct and we asked people to tell us about what they wanted to see in their precinct. And so one of the first um, exercises that we did is we, um, we did what's called particip participatory mapping. And so we looked at um, what values people had within their precinct. And so we asked them to put dots on a map, you know, and then they were, they were given a hard copy map on their table and they put dots on that would correspond to the colour of those values. So I'll run you just through those values now. It's the first value that we said, look, can you tell us where within your precinct there's civic values, where there's areas with trees that really 
um, are signatures of the city, where they contribute to the city's identity. Um, we said, you know, tell us about the natural values. Where are there ecosystems that exist that support flora and fauna within your precinct? We said, what, what are the, where are the cultural and heritage areas of the urban forest? Where um, are there trees that contribute to the history um, of Melbourne? Where are there the trees that contribute to the social aspects of Melbourne? Where do people congregate? Where are there sporting events and so forth? And lastly, it's life sustaining. Where are there trees that provide ecosystem services? Where do they um, uh, provide oxygen or mitigate stormwater and, and do those sorts of things? And so what did that actually look like? And this is in the workshop itself, people sitting around a table that had this map there and they'd be putting dots on the map and saying, you know, these are the areas that, that I see, that these are some culture and heritage areas. And each one of the tables, we typically have, you know, 100 people at a workshop, 10 tables. They'd be sitting around and all the people would be placing dots on the map. And then lastly, we'd ask them, we'd say, what are the new planting opportunities? Where do you want trees? And these would be stars on the map. And these, th this information feeds directly into our precinct plan, but it was a really important way to tease out how people viewed their precinct, what was important to them uh, in terms of values, and also where they wanted new trees. And so th these are some of the outputs. So th th these are heat maps that have been generated by RQ. Dave, Dr Dave Kendall at RQ um, consulted on this aspect of our project. But you can see these where people are, are identifying, you know, this is in North Melbourne, where there's key social values and you've got multiple dots. You know, we'd aggregate all those, all those maps from all the tables together and come up with a, an overall picture of the values that, and the opinions that people had from that precinct. The second exercise that we do pe with people in the workshop is really around preferences and character and what people would want to see in the future in terms of the character in the precinct and the tree planting in that precinct. And so what, what we would do is we'd avoid any debate about native or exotic trees. We'd talk about the character of trees that people like. So we'd, we'd present them with a series of photos. These photos here, there's probably 30 or 40 photos. These are the, the top photos for this particular precinct. Excuse me. But the, the emphasis of this exercise is really about not identifying what species is on the photo, but saying, what are the characteristics in this photo that appeal to you? Is it green or is it shady? Is it a continuous canopy? Does it have interest in terms of you know, the, tr the, the, the trunk of the tree? Or does it have autumn colour? And so people are identifying those characters they like rather than saying, no, I, I want them to all be native trees because I have a philosophical bent you know, in that direction. But we're saying, OK, but an exotic tree might might display or provide those similar ecosystem services, um, what, what is it really about the appearance of those trees or what the, the function of those trees that appeals to you? And just to illustrate around the point around um, character and species diversity, what we, what we do, um, it, we use this as an example in the, in the um, precinct workshops, is we say, look, a couple of these are elms, you know, and we're talking about the elm population in Melbourne not, not being reduced, but we're talking about planting different options to elms in many areas. So we say to people, well, how many of these are elms? They all look, they all look like elm leaves. I mean, this is you know, fairly typical in terms of an elm. But you know, there's a number of other trees that have very similar characteristics to elms in terms of their form, their size. Um, and we say, look, it's really about the character of the tree and the function of the tree rather than being wedded to an individual species. And these are some of the outputs from the precinct, precinct plan workshops. Um, and you can see these are, these are the, the words that came out from the participants about those character images and what they wanted to see within their precinct. And you can see you know, there are some similarities in terms of you know, like colour comes up a lot and shade comes up a lot. But this is a unique representation of what, that, what the people in those precincts want to see. And then, so the, the key task from this then is to, for us to distill this information back into the precinct plan and then to, to then, so that we can confidently go back to the community and say that information you gave us, here it is, here it is represented in the precinct plan. And so after the precinct plan workshop, we send them a report and we say, this is what you told us. Tell, if it, tell us if we've missed anything, tell us if it's not true and tell us what we need to add. Um, and so then that, that information is distilled down. And this is just one aspect of the precinct plan as an example. But this is how we prioritise our planting in each precinct, and this, this feeds into a 10-year planting plan. But you can see, 
there's six, six aspects to our planting priorities. This is, firstly, we do an opportunities assessment. We say, where are there gaps in streetscapes for new trees? We look at where there's vulnerable residents, you know, um, very young people or very old people, where the community has identified priority for greening. That's directly back to the, to, the, to the exercise in the workshop where they put the stars in the map. We say, well, where has the community said they want more trees? We look at where there's hot or very hot streets based on the thermal image, which I'll talk about in a moment, where our useful life expectancy assessment has identified trees that have a short useful life expectancy, and also, very importantly, we look at canopy cover. I mean, we have low levels of canopy cover that are likely to be resulting in hotter streets and so forth. So what are the, some of the online avenues that we've used to communicate and, uh, to communi uh, to, and, and for the community to participate with the program? This, this, this is specifically around our precinct plan. So we run our workshops, but we understand that often people aren't, aren't able to make it to the workshops. So what we've done is these are our most three precincts that we've completed, so Parkville, South, South Bank and Fisherman's Bend. And so we emulated those same activities that we do in the workshop online. So people were given the opportunity to talk about different parts of the precinct and say, look, can I get some more trees here? Or, you know, I like this area here because there's a, a nice canopy that covers the road. And so they could pin comments to that board online. And also they were able to do that character mapping exercise online by themselves. So they would rate, they would go through all the photos of the trees and they would rate them and say, I like this or I don't like this. I'd like to see this in my precinct or I wouldn't like to see this in my precinct. But it's all about character rather than saying, look, I, I really don't like pine trees. Well, what do you like in that image? Is it the fact that the canopies are touching or they have a deep green or there's you know, lots of shade on the ground? And it's, and it's really about character issues rather than individual species. And these are some of the comments that came back. You know, this, the, and, you know the, the, the important thing for us is to say, look, the comments are great, all the information is great, but we've got to capture this now, we've got to distill this into a meaningful format that can be presented into our precinct plan. So visual communication. One of the most important things that we've done is to, is to provide information in a format that people can easily digest. So, as I said before, the useful life expectancy assessment um, has been critical in, in communicating to people about the need for tree renewal and also about succession planning in the future. This isn't, the useful life expectancy is a prediction. It's not a removal. Um, it's not a removal date. It's not saying uh, in, t in year 10 we'll make sure that all those trees with a red dot are going to be removed. That's really about a prediction that allows us to do succession planting. So we know that we're going to lose a certain percentage of trees you know, in the, in the next 10 years or the next 20 years, and then we plan accordingly for that. So in our, in our calculations for canopy cover in the future, we allow for those losses, and so we're planting 3,000 trees a year to offset those losses in the future. And this is just some more detail around that. And you can see, I mean, this is, this is Royal Parade, you know, which was looking particularly scary at the end of the drought. Some of those trees have bounced back a little bit, but the writing on the wall is still there in terms of they're a mature tree, um, in a landscape now which is being increasingly um, compromised and, uh, and, it's, and it's expected that we will be replacing some of those trees in the, you know, near, in the near future. This is St Kilda Road, which is a project which will you know, probably be started next financial year. And this is just an example of a couple of trees on St Kilda Road, which, you know, the trees are still alive, but in terms of ecosystem services, you know, there's, there's hardly any canopy on those trees. They're not really shading anything. They're really museum pieces in the landscape. So if we're realistic about cooling the city and providing canopy, these sorts of trees are just not contributing. And this is just a visualisation that we use to communicate to people, say, well, what, what would be you know, the, the image if we were to remove all the elms or lose all the elms from, from Royal Parade? You know, and it's, and it's, it's really quite dramatic in terms of the overall effect. I mean, that's very much a part of the, the character of Melbourne. But, and on the, on the other side too, you know, it's, it's worth saying that the, the threat of Dutch elm disease is very, um, is very near. And so, you know, whilst we've got ULE predictions that say trees may be lost, you know, because of old age or senescence, um, you know, through natural processes, if there was a disease or pest that came in to affect that entire population, then that would be the reality as well. So diversity within our tree stock is really important. And this is some of the other ways we communicate to people. It's talking about the complex nature of streetscapes. 
A thermal image has been really important. This is, this is surface temperatures within the city. It illustrates you know, the urban heat island and how um, that, that heat's retained in the city. This is a, this is a summer night. You, know, you can see the forecourt at the MCG. You can see around you know, Yarra Park and some of those areas, some of the city intersections that receive that afternoon sun. You've got a lot of retained heat. And so that's emitting during the night and elevating the, the city temperatures. And a couple more images showing the influence of trees. Um, you know, particularly and canopy cover. This is one of our champion trees within the CBD. And you can see, you know, the influence of the, the shade and the temperatures underneath a tree as opposed to, you know, out within the streetscape itself. And one, some of the other images we use is we say to people, look, you're used to the aesthetic of Melbourne. You're used to plane trees and elm trees and, and overarching canopies over the road and, and that sort of aesthetic. But there are other species around the world and we're planting more lindens now, that it can achieve the same result. Um, but it doesn't have to be elms or plains. You know, it's the same with you know, ginkgos, fantastic autumn colour. Um, and this is another tree that we've, we've, we're, we're trialling. You know, some have been planted in the past. Um, they probably need to be more ma better matched to their site, but that's another avenue tree that we're exploring. And the same with zelkova, which is a good uh, replacement for elms in some ways. So this is some of the other collateral that we've used to communicate. So this is a one-page infographic. You know, we know people are busy, so we've just got the key messages. And so we provided this to people um, as a way of just really rapidly communicating what the urban forest strategy was about and what we were trying to achieve. We had a, a, a video on YouTube that um, Greg was involved with. And we had champions. One of our greatest champions was the Lord Mayor, and he still is to this day. And um, um, recently I, I heard him say that you know, he sees his legacy piece as being the tree planting in Melbourne, which is just so important in terms of the work that I do and the, support, the ongoing support for our program. Um, Vic Health came up earlier in the day. You know, they've been a really good champion for us, as, as a, some other groups there as well. You know, this was a, a comment from the Lord Mayor, um, particularly around, you know, the legacy that we leave. And this is from Vic Health, you know, a really good article about the benefits of trees in the urban environment. We've used, you know, some examples. Myrtle rust is a really good example for us to about to, to, to just demonstrate to people about the vulnerability of our tree population. You know, we have 43% of our current tree stock is in the family Matasi, and, and myrtle rust directly affects that family. So, it hasn't uh, exploded in Victoria like it might have been predicted to. You know, it might have um, been much worse than it than it could have been. So, sorry, it, it's progressed in New South, New South Wales, <laughs> but. Uh, in Victoria so far, we've only had a limited outbreak, so we're still waiting to see how that one progresses. And it's, it's really about being transparent. That's you know, one of our main focuses with engagement. This was a tree that was unfortunately poisoned you know, outside a development site. You can draw your own conclusions there. Um, but we commissioned an artist you know, to make that into an art piece. It was called Triage. Um, and so she effectively wrapped the tree in bandages and there were some, there were some candlelight vigils and, you know, um, there's a, there's a photo here of one of our councillors laying a wreath at the base of the tree. It stayed there for a number of weeks, and it was a real example of, you know, of, of tree loss in the city and the, and the effects of tree loss. One of our main tools for communicating to people about the ULE and, and loss in the future has been the, the urban forest visual. And that's an interactive map that has information about the ULE, how the trees were assessed, and people can go in and look at the ULE value, the species of the tree, um, and also, you know, as, a, as an add-on, when we were developing this program, we said, oh, well, let's put an email address in, you know, so people can email us if there's an issue about that tree. But that, you know, progressed into this, this thing, this kind of this evolved very organically from, um, you know, being a, something about a maintenance issue to we started getting these random emails from people, and some of them are quite beautiful and quite intimate. Um, and, you know, we've had thousands of emails now. Um, and... You know, some of them are, are, uh, are quite beautiful and some of them are, are less beautiful, but they, you know, they're really an insight into people's relationships with trees and it's, I guess it's a way that people connect with trees in a very unique way. One of the other things we're doing is a citizen forester program um, and that's, we've got over 200 people now who are interested in that program and are signed up to, to do more work in the city. And just finally, you know, what are the outcomes? You know, in, in terms of the media, the, the Herald Sun isn't so kind to us, but... It's all about getting the message out there. And so this was an important piece for us at the start of the program to educate people. We've had, we've had some champions. Um, this, is, this is not one of our champions. This is a piece that was written that was 
you know, that she'd, she'd actually misunderstood some of the outcomes from the program. But the letter was in the age. Two days later, we had a letter from, from Joe Griggs at the Friends of the Elms, and she basically set us straight. She said, no, no, you've, you've misunderstood. This is what's happening. We're confident in the city of Melbourne and what they're doing. So it's great that the message is out there and we've got champions who are working for us. You know, another article from, this is from Megan Backhouse, talking about greening of the city. Um, this is another one in the age. You know, this is all very supportive and, and uh, in terms of communicating our message. Um, so, you know, from New South Wales, recognising our work and saying, look, why can't we do the same here? And then essentially, just to finish, you know, these are some of the comments that came from our website. You know, people were really, really positive about the interaction that we're doing, the transparency of the process, and particularly about the opportunities to be involved in the way that they, you know, shape the city of Melbourne in the future. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you.